Hello everyone and welcome back to the Barely Bookish Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about Peter Pan and Wendy and I'm joined, oh, I'm joined, uh, wow, I'm stumbling over my words, and I'm joined today with Rebecca. Oh, I'm Rebecca Kenny and I write uh, fantasy romance. I started out writing young adult fantasy and then I just started leaning in more to the steamy side of that. So um, I have a bunch of books out right now. Um, a young adult trilogy, and then um, some adult romance as well, and a uh, Peter Pan duology. So, um, and I signed, well, I had an agent and then um, left that agent and I just signed with a new agent. So I'm excited about that um, going on submission this year. So Exciting. I'm really (laughs) excited to read uh, your Peter Pan book. I, I actually got Kindle Unlimited to read yours and i was like i committed i was like at this point you know i'm reading enough books on my uh like kindle app that i was like i just need to commit yeah i love it and they'll give you a good deal sometimes you know when you first sign up they'll give you like three months for a low price or whatever so yeah they gave me six months for thirty dollars i was like absolutely like i i have scribd which is good but it's really limited yeah and so I, I do that one and then I have my library apps and I was just like buying a lot of paperbacks, but I like live in a really small apartment. Like I have two shelves in this apartment. So otherwise I have to like transport them to my parents' house and be like, here's more of the stockpile. Don't look at them. Thank you. <laughs> so Kindle Unlimited is the way to be right now. But we're going to jump right into talking about Peter Pan and Wendy. Um, right off the bat, I'm going to say that my main experience with Peter Pan is the Disney movie. Um, that's my only experience with Peter Pan and that's all I have. What was your experience before you started your book? So I, you know, watched the Peter Pan movie as a kid and, um, I always like, I loved it and I totally had a crush on Peter. (laughs) So, um. I had read part of the original, I think, early on, but not the whole thing. So before I wrote the books, I went ahead and I read the original. And I was like, I was surprised at how interesting and like offbeat it is. And, you know, definitely not something that kids would probably be reading today (laughs) in some places. Um, There's definitely some some things that have not aged well. Yeah, I will say, I don't know what it is about 20s um, children's stories, but, like, they're all a little dark. I don't, like, the 1920s was apparently a rough time for children. Yeah. I just read uh, Alice in Wonderland as well and talked about it on the podcast, so I am fresh in the 20s for kids' novels, I guess. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So... Starting with chapter one, the very first line we get is all children except one grow up. So we're starting off really strong. Yeah, yeah, that's that's quite the line there. Like, I'm honestly, I kind of feel bad for Peter Pan a little bit. Like, I feel like being like stuck at like 14 years old seems like the worst age to be stuck at. Yeah. Um, does it actually say how old he is? I don't remember. It says Wendy is 14. Oh, but yeah. it doesn't so, say he's her size, right? Yeah, so I'm guessing he's got to be around a similar age, maybe. Yeah. It's it's weird because it says, like, he still has all his first teeth, like, all his mm-hmm. baby teeth, which is just it's strange, you know, to think yeah. of him being that tall. But, like, yeah. It's, it's kind of terrifying. Yeah. 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 It's like, I don't even know what age you start to lose teeth, but like 14 seems late. So he's got to be younger than yeah. her. So he's maybe like 10, 11. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a dentist. <laughs> uh, so uh, they also describe Wendy's mother as having a mocking mouth, which I, I was like, does this just mean she like smirks a lot? I guess. Yeah. It was like. It's like, you know, she has that one kiss at the corner of her mouth that nobody can ever get, you know, not even her husband, apparently. I know. So it's almost like 
you know, this reserved part of herself. And it talks about how she has like the boxes in her heart, like layered like a nesting doll or whatever. And he mm -hmm. could never get into the innermost one, you know? So it's almost like she's reserved this bit of herself and nobody can get to it. You know? I know. It's interesting to me too, that like, this is, we don't really know much about George, but like, we know so much about uh, Mrs. Darling and like, she's already kind of complex for the four chapters we've got of her so far and i love that because it's not something i see most of the time mm -hmm. like i wonder who this part of her is reserved for that's what i want to know is it for, reserved for herself does she have a secret lover i don't know i don't know um it's it's almost like i i kind of think that peter is a little bit not not over sexualized really but like it mentions in the book a few times about how um you know women can't resist this particular tone of voice that he uses and like how he's so appealing i don't know mm -hmm. if that's just like the mother aspect or if mm -hmm. you know it's more than that i i just thought it was a little it's a little odd i think it even says at some point that it says something about that kiss that she's reserved and like something about Peter. Oh, and it also talks about when she's dancing mm -hmm. that she goes so fast, all you can see of her is the kiss. Yeah. Which I don't understand what this kiss is. I, I don't know. It's, I think it's really open to interpretation. Yeah. I, yeah. I was like, is it a dimple? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just like, I don't know. Well, you know, you, you might be right about that. Yeah. I just can't imagine like what would be on the side of your face. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like it's either like a dimple or like a mole, a birthmark, something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like I need to rewatch the Disney movie to figure out what they made it. I don't think they have anything on her face. I don't remember. <laughs> Hold on. Let me Google Mrs. Darling in the Disney film. Let's find out. See if she's got like a dimple or a little beauty mark. Yeah, you're right. There's nothing on her face. Yeah. So it's either it's either an actual like dimple beauty mark mole or something or it's like a metaphorical thing. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows what the what this author was thinking in a lot of places of this book. Honestly. It's like blush or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, so then they go on to tell us that the reason that Mr. Darling was able to actually marry her is solely because he was the first one there because instead of running he took a car right which is interesting because later he's shown to be kind of a cheapskate you know yeah. but he invested the money you know to get there and get her but it's also i told my husband that he was like how how does that make any you know like why would she just choose him because he got there first and it, that goes back to the whole thing of how she's never quite given him full access to her heart you know i just mm -hmm. wonder if it was like more of a convenience thing but you know because sometimes in that in that day and age you know it was more like well you got an offer go ahead and take it because you might not get another one yeah. although it sounds like she had plenty of options um, i'm wondering too if it's one of those things where her parents pushed her into it because he showed up in a car which implies <laughs> that he had money <laughs> you know like yeah. I don't blame them. You know, you want the best for your kid. So I could right. see them being like. Yeah. And always... especially during that time period, you know, women's options were a lot more limited. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just I think that's funny is that that's the one thing that she was like, all right, I'm sold. <laughs> you got a car. A car. It's very high school, you know. I know. I mean, that's probably when they got married. So. Right. <laughs> um. Can you tell that I read a lot of like 1800s novels? I'm like, everyone's like 16 when they're getting married, right? I know, I know. <laughs> um, so then we get to the next line of like Wendy's birth. And they're talking about in the hospital room, like giving her up for adoption. Right. And right. they're like running the numbers of like if they can afford to have this child. And it's insane to me. It is. It totally is. And um, that's another reason why I was like, yeah, he's he's a cheapskate for sure. I, I mean, they're poor, apparently. Yeah. But it's like he's holding her hand and calculating expenses. I just like, you sure you've done that before? <laughs> this is not what you do right after you've had a child. <laughs> yeah. 
I feel like that should have been like discussed months maybe. in advance. Yeah. At <laughs> least like the day before, you know. <laughs> They're like, you know, you're at nine months. Maybe we should think about if we're keeping this child. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Mr. Darling is really obsessed with like keeping appearances. So mm-hmm. he wants to have a nurse because all of the other neighbors have nurses uh, for their children. And this is how they get the dog Nana. <laughs> Nana is the highlight of the Disney movie for me. Yes. I was a big dog person as a child. I uh-huh. still, I still love dogs. Um, but like I would watch a movie and only remember the dog. Yeah. So Nana was a highlight. I distinctly remember Nana most of the movie. Everything else falls on the wayside for me. I really wanted a dog and I did not have a dog until I was like 14. I think they really, in the movie, they kept her very close to how she is in the book. She's kind of this anthropomorphized, I can't say that properly. Mm -hmm. You know, she's like, she's an animal, but with like people traits. Oh, yeah. So she can do things that regular animals cannot do. Mm -hmm. And it makes, it talks about how expressive she is, you know. Yeah. And she like tucks the kids into bed, walks them to school. Like this dog is the best dog, apparently. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they also then talk about Mrs. Darling rifling through her kid's mind. Um, apparently like all parents do uh i was i was like oh every parent becomes a mind reader like you have your child then you're like all right time to mind read yeah so glad (laughs) so glad i had this latent ability it's probably more like you know she's sitting at their bedside kind of talking through the day with them Mm -hmm. and like seeing where they're at yeah, I'd hope so, but then, like, the next line's like, yeah, what she learned is about a name, Peter Pan. And I was like, right. okay. <laughs> like, I like to take things literally when I read this, because I just think it's funnier. But it also, is. like, it's probably, like, she was, like, talking with her kids, looking through their journals or whatever, and saw their drawings where they kept drawing Peter Pan. She's like, who is this? But hey, it's a fantastical story, so maybe she did have some kind of mind-reading ability. You never maybe. Know very very possible (laughs) so then we start talking about neverland and i was like okay neverland and this is a dreamscape cool cool we've established that now i know it's just a dream only a dream yeah yeah and then but it's like it's a shared dream almost because later on um when they get there it's like they recognize each other's parts of neverland Mm -hmm. so it's almost like like when I was a kid, my brother and sister and I, we would make like these maps of fictional worlds that we would role play in kind of. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like that sort of thing, like a shared imaginary world, but also, like you said, a, a dreamscape. So, yeah. Yeah, I really like the idea that of it being like this shared dream, but I also wonder if it was something where they all like played in it, mm-hmm. kind of like you were saying, like in real life and then like they all started dreaming about it because i feel like that happens a lot when you're a kid too oh sure yeah yeah because it says when you play at it by day with the chairs and tablecloth it is not you know it's not scary but then right before bed it it feels like super real Mm -hmm. something like horror movies too right (laughs) just that little space before you go to sleep you know that yeah, I started like listening to this Urban Legends podcast. Uh, Spirits podcast is like one of my favorite podcasts, and I was listening to it once as I was like taking a walk for, before bed, dead of night, and I got so freaked out one time, and I was like, "Okay, whoops." <laughs> nope. Um, also, we find out there's a prince on Neverland, which I had never really heard about, and that he apparently has like six brothers, and he's the youngest. Oh, I don't remember seeing that. It's right towards the end of, or I guess it's middle of chapter oh, one. The, oh, I don't know how I missed that. Oh, wait. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's like a throwaway line. Yes. I was like, this is so weird. There is a lot of just like random stuff. Yeah. There's, he's like, oh, one of the kids is like hunting. And I was like, why? Mm-hmm. 
So, um, Mrs. Darling starts asking about Peter Pan, uh, and she's like, yeah, I learned this while mind reading. Sure. Um, but then it's revealed that Mrs. Darling also had experiences with Peter Pan, which I kind of remember from the Disney movie, because isn't Mrs. Darling Jane? And then... I think Jane is Wendy's daughter in the second Disney uh, movie, but I've never seen it, so I can't be sure. But you might be right. Definitely, um, at the end of the Disney movie, it's the dad in that one that says he has the strangest feeling he's seen that ship before. The, you know, while as Peter's ship sails off. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. But yeah, it definitely in the book, it, it indicates that she's heard of him or had some experience with him. Mm -hmm. And what I found really cool, and it doesn't really go into, this is like another throwaway line that when children die, he goes part of the way with them so they won't be frightened. Yeah. I'm like, also, that doesn't sound like the Peter we get through it the rest of the novel. Not. It does right? not. The, the Peter that is so careless of human life, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really doesn't. Yeah. And so careless of the children's comfort later on and, and their care. Um, it does not sound like him. So maybe that was just a legend she heard that was not really true. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe there's like two Peter Pans. Maybe the shadow goes with them. The shadow Could seems be. more chill. Could be. Yes. Uh, so Peter Pan leaves leaves on the ground uh and like now the lines are officially starting to get blurred between are they dreaming is this real what's going on it's yeah. felt like a beetlejuice moment like they <laughs> said peter pan one too many times and now he has appeared there he is yep so another it's another night and mrs darling actually falls asleep in the nursery while knitting uh and she's sleeping by the fire which, worst place to fall asleep, because now your neck's all crammed. <laughs> Very true. Um, and then Mrs. Darling gets woken up, and Peter Pan's just in the room. Mm -hmm. Apparently didn't even notice her, I guess. Yeah. And then, like, when he sees her, he starts, like, gnashing his teeth at her. Uh-huh. Terrifying. If a tiny child came in to a third story bedroom that I was in, I would be horrified. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> and it says he's like dressed in skeleton leaves and sap, basically the juices that ooze out of trees. So that's just, that's very Fay right there. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. It, this book has a lot of Fay energy for me. It really does. And it's that darker, um, malevolent, almost malevolent kind of, I mean, he's not really, there's there's just a like almost a psychopathic tendency to to the fae stories especially like mm -hmm. coming out of like england and britain and stuff like that from the you know the older days there's like this there's this malevolence there and and you sense that a little bit from him but obviously he's he's nicer to the children than that yeah but like sometimes you're like he could not be like on a whim like right. you might just be like you know it'd be fun as if i just never spoke to these kids again and left them hanging in the air right terrifying to me yeah it's like a careless kind of mischief yeah yeah so then we are on to chapter two uh nana comes in and scares peter away uh he also disappears as a shooting star which is rather cool like it means he's really fast but it's it's pretty cool mm -hmm. however we do find out that nana then kidnaps peter's shadow that's right. Which, like, the shadow plot line is something that always kind of confused me as a kid. Because I was like, why is the shadow able to detach and reattach? Yeah. Like, yeah. was he walking around just, like, broad daylight, no shadows? Or That would be very strange. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, that kid's a ghost. <laughs> uh, so Mrs. Starling then hung the shadow outside the window so that he could get it back but then she's like this kind of looks like i'm hanging dirty laundry <laughs> so she's like not sure what to do and i think that's funny to me yes and she doesn't ask mr darling because he's too busy figuring out how much winter coats are going to cost which is very on brand for him mm -hmm. <laughs> i just think it's funny is that she has this evening dress and he has like this suit and they're like oh yeah let's still try and figure out winter coat right. situation where i'm like just why do you have an evening dress yeah 
So, uh, Mrs. Darling uh, decides to roll the shadow up and stuff it in a drawer. Which, again, I'm still just, like, trying to figure out if this is, like, a black fabric situation. Yeah, I think in the Disney movie, it almost looked like a, like, gauzy, you know, like a kind of a filmy black gauze type of stuff. But, yeah, it never really explains why his shadow can detach. That'd be, like, kind of convenient if I could make my shadow do tasks for me. I'm like, mm-hmm. hey, go wash the laundry, and then it just detaches. And... That'd be yeah. delightful. I'd love that for me. It's a fun concept, for sure. <laughs> Um, so then, you know, Peter comes back. Oh, sorry. Then, like, we get, like, a flash forward a little bit before we flash back. And then he's, and it's, like, the parents come home and the kids are all gone. Mm Mm-hmm. And then they're, they're, like, thinking back on what happened. Mm -hmm. And the part that gets me here is how... Mr. Darling pours his medicine in poor Nana's bowl. Yeah. And that's just like, that's like animal abuse or something. Oh, yeah. Please don't do that. That's horrible. I was also trying to figure out if this isn't actually medicine and is instead like alcohol or something. I thought that too, but he doesn't seem to want to drink it. And they mentioned that it looks like milk. So I was thinking maybe it's some kind of like vitamin tonic thing. They used to take all kinds of weird stuff. Or it's cocaine. So. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the 20s. Isn't that like... I don't know. But no matter what it is, like, poor Nana. Yeah, right? Don't do that to your dog, man. I know. And then he, like, gets all uncomfortable that, you know, he got shown up that, like, he's kind of a trash person. And then puts Nana outside for it. And I'm like... I know. You jerk. Oh, and it says, um, she got dog hair on his pants. They were not only new trousers, but they were the first he'd ever had with braid on them. I don't know what that means. And he had to bite his lip to prevent the tears from coming. Honestly, he's probably my least favorite character. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Very unsympathetic character, like obsessed with being admired, obsessed with whether or not he can afford his children. Mm -hmm. And just like, I don't know. I mean, I'm all for like strong men crying or whatever, but this is like a wimpy sort of like I got dog hair on my pants, so I'm going to cry. I know just he's like, just nope. so concerned with his image and what other people think of him and it's yes. terrible yes yeah so then like they reflect basically on the entire night and like not only did that happen but he also was, came in freaking out about his tie and he couldn't get his tie to tie yeah. and then Mrs. Darling had to do his tie and then also Mrs. Darling makes a comment about dogs not having souls just out of the blue she's like oh you know she must take so good such good care about of them like because they have souls or something like that and i was like why why would you say that yeah that's always one of those beliefs that has always bothered me where i'm like like I don't know, man. I just think I'm like I if I don't get to see my dog in the afterlife, I don't want it. Yeah, and that's. I mean, nobody can say if you believe in souls, then I mean you can't prove that animals don't have souls. Like, Mm -hmm. there's, yeah, there's like plenty of like religions where animals do get souls, and I'm like, I like that better. Thank you. I know, I know, and yeah, my sister, she had this cat that was just like he was the best thing i'm convinced that animal Mm -hmm. had a soul he's gone now but um yeah just you can't not believe it yeah my dog is into those eyes you know it's like yeah my dog that like recently passed was like the best and Mm -hmm. i'm like if i can't see her later i don't want it and like I love my cat too, and she's delightful. And I'm just like, I, I refuse to believe they don't have souls. Yeah, it's just that the emotions that, mm-hmm. especially dogs, are capable of. It just it feels like they must. Right? Yeah, they have too much personality. I know. Uh, the whole reason this med conversation came up is because they were like trying to give their kids medicine, which they were basically trying to like drug their kids to go to sleep. Right? People used to do that. Oh my goodness. They would give them, like, a little bit of alcohol or something and, like, put him to sleep. 
That's what I thought. That's why I thought this was like alcohol. You you know, you you might be right about that. Yeah, I can't imagine what else cuz like it says it was the color of milk, but it may have had alcohol in it like mm-hmm. and then like something else to make it not look like that. I have no idea. You know, it'd be interesting to do research and try to figure out like I'd be interested to know what his pants looked like cuz it said it has the braid on the pants. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming that's some kind of trim and then like research the medicine yeah i'm gonna have to see if i can figure this out because i feel like i need to know yeah i need to know we all need to know the disney movie they do include that part with the tie Mm -hmm. but they make him a lot more bombastic and like antagonistic in the movie Mm -hmm. like he's he's a much stronger personality and like there's a lot more anger not so much the anxiety and like you know Mm -hmm. he's a completely different character in the disney movie i think yeah i I have like kind of memories of him with like i just remember him being very yelly Mm -hmm. definitely like once i read this i'm gonna have to rewatch the movie yes so uh michael and his father arguing over who ought to take it first uh which is how then you know he's like my medicine is worse his father says and then they're like okay i'll take it if you take it and then he ends up pouring it into the dog's bowl. And then the worst thing is too is that Nana takes like a lick and looks really disappointed, has a tear, and goes and lays down. Poor baby. Yeah, I was like, oh, she thought yeah. she was getting a special little treat. I know, and it says, you know, that look that noble dogs get. I can so see it. You know, mm-hmm. like if you've ever had one of those like big sad eyed dogs, it's like. I can I can see that. That's such a good yeah. description in just a few words, honestly. Oh yeah. And then uh as Mrs. Darling puts the kids to bed, Nana we, uh lets out a bark of like warning that danger's coming. Yeah. Which is again, love this for Nana. She's so, really great. She yeah. is. I love her so much. Uh, Turns out even the stars are on Peter's side, which is really weird because he antagonizes them the whole time. Mm -hmm. Like he tries to go up behind them and blow them out. Could you imagine? Like he's literally just killing stars for funsies. I know. He is such a, um, he's quite the complex character. And I think it shows a little bit of that in the Disney adaptation, but not nearly as much as as we get in the book, you know, yeah. the layers. And part of that is because, you know, obviously he's grown up with no no adults to tell him, hey, this is morally wrong. Yeah. He grew up among fairies who apparently, you know, it, it says later they have room for only one emotion at a time, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like if he's feeling mischievous, He's not thinking about the well-being of any other entity besides himself. Mm-hmm. His own amusement. I know. I really like this for Peter, though. Like, because I feel like in the Disney movies, he wasn't as mis- like mischievous. Mischievous, right? Right. Yeah. And I feel like, because you know, they had to make role models for kids. They knew who was going to watch this, whereas in this one. I, I really don't know who this book was written for, to be honest. Like, it seems, like, geared towards children. But I'm wondering if it's one of those books that, like, parents are supposed to read to their kids. Because I, I can't imagine a kid sitting down and reading this. Right. At least not, like, a modern-day kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Like, some of these books that used to be written for children, mm-hmm. it really does seem as if a lot of the adult mindset filtered through. Whereas nowadays people who write for middle grade or, or younger, mm-hmm. they have to be careful of, you know, keeping it on a certain grade level, certain mm-hmm. word choice. They weren't worried as much about that in, you know, in these times in the time when this was written. So um, yeah. So you get some stuff in there that's definitely not necessarily things a kid would, would think of or maybe even enjoy i don't know yeah i i also think it's strange too because like the language barrier on this a little bit because like the way it's written it's obviously like 
there's a lot of weird symbolism and you can tell that it was an older like book so i feel like that isn't aiding this problem either like a modern day kid isn't gonna sit down and be like oh this is for pure enjoyment let me read this really quick right yeah and i think that's why you get some adaptations and like you get the uh things that have been cut down and edited a bit you know Mm -hmm. for modern kids for sure so then we are on to chapter three so even the night lights end up turning off at Peter's presence, which is super interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I will say that when they disappear, I thought it was just for the night. Like in my memory, I really thought they got back by the time the parents got back from the party. Mm-hmm. Like I don't. Sorry. They do in the movie. They, they get back the same night. Like time is different there or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it, I don't remember because I haven't read past a certain point, but I think it's been like days. Yeah. Like when they're traveling, they're like, oh, they see day, night, day, night, day, night. And I'm like, whoa, kids. And they're like starting to get really hungry and really tired. That for me is one of the, yeah. And they start, I guess we're skipping it a little, but a little bit falling asleep. And like falling down towards the ocean and Peter, you know, he's coming to catch them, but it's like a game for him. And it says, you never know if next time he might just let you fall. Yeah. Just for fun, you know, terrifying food for them out of the mouths of birds Mm -hmm. on the way. It's like, what is happening? (laughs) Terrifying. Uh, But so we have the arrival of Tinkerbell now though. Uh, Okay, I have to talk about Tinkerbell in this book because very clearly he says that she is still a growing girl and then like the next line or two he talks about her figure. Mm -hmm. That's disgusting. Yeah, and this is one of those places where, you know, it's a bit Mm over-sexualized and, you know, obviously Disney played that up as well Mm -hmm. as she's basically a little pinup girl in the movie. Um. Which is fine. I'm all about, you know, like showing what you've got or whatever. But in a kid's book, the the emphasis on her her figure or whatever is a little odd. To I me, guess. it was gross because it seemed like it was like a little bit of pedo behavior. Like it's obvious, like when you say that she's still a growing girl, that you imagine her to be a child. Right. And so talking about a child's figure is disgusting. And this kind of goes back to why you know certain elements of this book do make me uncomfortable especially the way peter is portrayed as well Mm -hmm. in a number of places um and and it just makes you wonder a little bit um and i know people have had the same questions about alice in wonderland as well Mm -hmm. it's just like uh some of these authors you just wonder like what the thought process was behind this like are you really writing for children what is going on here Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not saying like, we don't know, so there's only so much we can read into it, but yeah, you're right. There's definitely like a factor here. That's a little, what, what is going on? Yeah. And I'm more uncomfortable knowing that he wrote this because he was like really close to a family. And I'm like, "Mm, Mm Hmm, that doesn't sit right with me. Yeah, actually. Yeah. So, uh, Peter is frantically searching for his shadow at this point and he accidentally shuts Tinkerbell in a drawer which I do remember this scene from the Disney movie. Yes. Uh, and then he can't get his shadow to reattach, so he tries, like, soap and water. Which, like, not sure why that would work. I'm, I'm really not sure what he was thinking with that. Not thinking. Probably. He literally is sap. He's attached his own clothes. I don't right. understand. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> so then Wendy wakes up and she starts roasting Peter about his... Uh, lack of middle names as well as his address and I thought that was hilarious yeah it's like your name's too short and you have a weird address yeah he's like second star to the uh, right and straight on till morning and she's like that's a weird address my address is blah 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 and honestly that's almost like more younger kid behavior like Mm -hmm. I have a seven year old and I could totally see her like in the most innocent not trying to be mean sort of way like oh your address is weird huh you know yeah (laughs) just not but when he's what 14 she should be a little more tactful i guess yeah i don't know they like 
aged her down like she doesn't feel 14 to me she does not and that's that's another strange thing here it's like they're supposed to be a certain age but they don't act like that they act Mm -hmm. a lot younger i also didn't think she was 14 in the disney movie either like i thought tinkerbell was like a young woman almost Mm -hmm. and that like you know peter pan's just an immortal so Mm -hmm. he's like thousands of years old but i thought wendy was like 10 Mm -hmm. max i i would say that's probably about how old she is she's like 10 11 something like that in the book though i started to think she was like seven like Mm -hmm. while she talks i'm like she feels like really young to me but i also don't have children so all these numbers are just like my idea of what like a kid is around that age point yeah uh so then wendy's like hold on i'll sew your shadow on your foot ouch yeah i was like originally i thought she said shoe and then she said this is gonna hurt a little bit i'm like what and i like look back up and it said foot and i was like oh (laughs) no kidding it's gonna hurt (laughs) yeah like uh who decided that was a good idea right like what are the rules of this magical shadow and Mm -hmm. and how it gets attached or detached Yes. And that's that's one thing about this book. It never explains any of the magic. Never explains it at all. No. And you know, today in modern fantasy, it's like, well, you have to explain where the magic comes from. Mm-hmm. And you have to have all these rules for it. And in this book, it's just like, it's there. It doesn't make sense. Deal with it. <laughs> I honestly, sometimes I'm like, it must have been so easy to be an author in the 20s. Yeah. Like, I think you're right. This is my magic. Thank you. Like, I'm trying to write a book right now. And like, yeah. I just started. I've always like casually tried to write books, but like I'm actually actively working on it now. Like it's taking me forever, but like I'm, I'm I'm working on it and I'm like so terrified about like explaining magic. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to keep doing that thing where like, you know, when you do your first really rough draft, you just like parenthesis mark and you're like, insert a fight scene. I do that all the time. (laughs) And That's I funny. highlight in yellow so that I like, so I don't miss anything. <laughs> like, you know, when I go back through, I'm like, oh, here's a big gap. I need to fill this in later, you know? Oh, but yeah, I do that all the time. That's that's totally a legit writer thing to do. I know. That's like what I'm doing right now. Cause I'm like, I'll research fighting scenes later. Later. Yep. I'm like, well, just that's in there. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get back we to it. We know what's supposed to happen there. It'll happen eventually. Somehow it'll be cute. <laughs> it makes sense but moving on you know like that's how what mine is like um so if i end up writing a book as if i was a 20s author um yeah. not saying that it wasn't difficult it just seems a little bit easier a little easier yeah i have one series where i kind of do that with the magic and i don't really explain it that's mm-hmm. one of my self-published ones so i don't have to because it's not like a traditional published thing i don't have to be as careful so i just like here's the magic you know it is easier (laughs) love that love that it's like i'm at this point where i'm like in my head i know how i'm gonna have to like explain it a little bit and like it's a gift from gods kind of and i'm like i'm gonna have to go through that too much and i'm gonna have to put some limits on these very cool gods and i don't want to yeah but that's the thing here there's like there's no rules. You just grab a needle and thread and there's the shadow attached to your foot again. This is how it works. I just, the amount of drugs most people feel like they were on when they were writing books <laughs> in the 20s. Yes. Like, oh, yes. Alice in Wonderland especially, I was like, you have to be taking something nasty. Oh my gosh, that book is so strange. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's good. And like, you have to, you, you just keep reading because you're like, what the heck am I reading? Like, I'm just going to keep going just to see you know <laughs> mm-hmm. fever dream materials how i like right to talk about it. right so uh after she sews his shadow back on peter is like thanking himself for thinking of this and she's like are you serious right now like yeah. what's wrong with you and then she gets so mad at him she like tucks herself back into bed and puts her blanket over her head and i was like excellent yes Love that you go girl you go girl don't let the guy take credit for something you did absolutely and then peter in his little manipulative way you know 
Wendy, one girl is more use than 20 boys, you know, in that voice, it says that no woman has ever yet been able to resist. Mm-hmm. Like, why is this like 10 year old suave, though? Right. It does say that like when he was the, when he was with the fairies, like when he grew up with the fa- not grew up, but he was hanging out with the fairies, he learned the grand manner mm-hmm. or whatever. So like some level of manners was taught to him, I guess, but maybe maybe they taught him to be suave. I guess. I mean, the Fae have to be suave. Right. (laughs) So then Wendy asks if she should give Peter a kiss, but he doesn't know what this means. (laughs) And then, like, she gives him a thimble because she doesn't want to explain it. And then he gives her an acorn back. And so she puts the acorn on a necklace chain. And then the book gives us like the most like doom and gloom like line. And they're like, yeah, this saves her life later. I'm like, whoa. Spoiler what? alert. Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like the 20s love to do this because they do it in The Great Gatsby a lot as well, where they're like, yeah, this is important later. Yes. Guess what's going to happen. Talk about foreshadowing, except it's like, here's the thing. Not even yeah. a shadow of the thing, but like, here's what's going to happen. They're like, symbolism, not here. <laughs> Wendy then asked Peter how old he is and he's like I have literally no idea I ran away the day I was born which how do you even do that not possible no just, I don't think he just doesn't remember where he came from and so he just made that up yeah you just you just like tuck and roll out of your like newborn crib or right I mean yeah newborns can't even they can't roll. Even roll for like a while yeah <laughs> I don't remember when, like at, how many months it is before they start rolling, but yeah. At least a couple, right? Oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be terrifying if newborns could roll? It would be. My goodness. Ugh. No. I, mm-mm, mm-mm. I mean, it's... Ugh. The baby stage, they're so fragile. Like, give me the older kids any day. I'm yeah. so glad mine are older now. <laughs> a little less fragile. <laughs> So Peter's reasoning for running away as an infant is that apparently his parents started talking about all the things he hoped they hoped for when he grew up to be a man. Yeah. And he's like, mm, I didn't want to grow up, so I left. Yeah. And, and he says he away, could, sorry. Ran away to live with the fairies, apparently. <laughs> yeah, and Kensington Gardens, which <laughs> random. Right. Kensington's a lovely place. Um, but like very weird, very out of the blue. Mm-hmm. Don't understand why. Why are the fairies there of all places? And did they give him like whatever his powers are? Because he's obviously got some magic going on, right? So, yeah. you know, did he get it from them? Again, the magic is not explained. <laughs> I know. It's like all we know is like he flies via fairy dust like everybody else, apparently. Yes. But like he seems to constantly have fairy dust on him. Right. So I don't know. Like it's it's weird. And then like who stopped his aging process? Exactly. Um, so Peter says that fairies come from the first laugh of a baby. And then that laugh breaks into a thousand pieces and becomes a thousand fairies. But then every time a kid says they don't believe in fairies, a fairy dies. Yeah. So it's like this beautiful, adorable origin story for fairies. And then this terrible, horrible, you know, this is how they die. Yeah. I'm like, um, okay. Like, what? And also, I don't feel like kids say they don't believe in fairies really much. Like, that's no. just something you just don't talk about. Right. Like, if you don't believe in them, you just, it doesn't really, you don't have to say it or express it. It's mm-hmm. not really. So hopefully there are not all these dead fairies lying around all over the place. So next thing, next, Tinkerbell finally gets let out of the drawer, which she was in there for probably like 20 minutes. Like, yeah, way too long not happy about it no like how did no one notice like she is a light source 
and, and it's like she's she's saying all these bad words right she flew about the nursery screaming with fury and peter tells her she shouldn't say such things and then later on it talks about how she's saying offensive or like ugly words you know so tink has a foul mouth apparently i love that for her <laughs> i love tinkerbell she's like swearing at him for leaving her in there which i just i want the adult tinkerbell of her just like cussing out peter pan constantly <laughs> it would be hilarious to me yeah like i want i don't know i'm petitioning out into the world some sort of like gritty office novel of peter pan and tinkerbell where they're like partners in crime and they have to like solve murders or something. I don't know. And then he, uh, Tinkerbell just has a really foul mouth. And she just swears at him like all the time. Yeah. Like something dumb or conceited. Yeah. I want that. I don't I don't care you what they do. You should write it. You should write it. I'm telling you. Do it. I mean, after the one you're already writing, right? You're going to. So you're going to start having like this whole list of projects that you want to write. Like we all do. Right. So your next thing is going to be the contemporary Peter and Tink thing. You should totally do it. I know. <laughs> I just, I, I know that like my niche is going to be like rewriting classic literature. And I'm just, I'm terrified. It's oh, going to be so fun. But it's, it's so terrifying. fun. Yes. I know. Uh, I like simultaneously am happy I'm getting back into writing and also terrified. Oh, yes. Wow, that's the, the state we're all in constantly, I think. Yeah, yeah. totally. So I was like, maybe writing's not for me. And then I was like, my book idea, this was a book idea I had at like high school. And it was like, now that I'm like more into like new adult and the yeah. spicy books, I was like, I can make this better. You can do it. Yes. Yes. Anyways, back to the book. Uh, so... Tinkerbell is named Tinkerbell because she mends the pots and kettles. That does not seem to fit her at all. No, it doesn't. Like, I was like, I would not imagine Tinkerbell being someone who actually tinkers. Like, sweating and hammering and, like, soldering handles onto pots and, like, you know. Yeah. It's not like, seems like stuff up. Maybe. I don't know. But, yeah, it doesn't quite seem to suit her personality. Yeah. I don't know, I just can't imagine it, but also I feel like I've never seen Tinkerbell actually work. So, who knows? Maybe she used to bend the pots and kettles and then she decided that hanging around with Peter was more fun. Fair enough. I don't know. Uh, so, Peter Pan starts being like super suspicious and he says that lost boys have no female companionship. I'm like, mm, where did he even learn the word female companionship? Like, I know. Where did he get this from? I know. I was like, this is super sus. And then she, like, actually ends up trying to, uh, like, Wendy ends up kissing Peter. And then, like, Tinkerbell pulls her hair. Freaks out. Yeah. yeah. Which, adorable for Tinkerbell. And she darts about again using offensive language. Write the offensive language in. I want to see it. Book. It's a kid's book, right? Is it though? Like at this point, you Not. know? <laughs> right? Like, it's a kid's book written for adults, to be honest. Yeah, it, it definitely has that feel. Yeah, Tink's definitely jealous. Oh, yeah. So then uh, Peter reveals that he comes up to their window at night to hear stories, which is kind of cute, but also really scary. Yeah. So he's been stalking them and like sneaking around. Yep. So Wendy says that she could tell stories to the other boys. And then Peter looks like super greedy. And he's like, hey, how about this? I'll teach you to fly. Don't even worry about it. And you can come to Neverland. Mm -hmm. And Wendy's like, okay, but like, can I bring my brothers? So she's like involving more people into this problem. That seems like a terrible idea to me, but I'm like, okay. Go off, I guess, if you want to bring your brothers. Like, I don't think they're going to be in any help in this situation. No. Nope. Suddenly there's no more barking. And everyone's like, oh, time to pretend to be asleep. Which, we've all been there. Love that. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
So uh, Lisa comes in with Lisa? Lisa. It has a Z. Liza? Liza? Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, And and this is another thing because it seemed to mention earlier that she said that she swore she had, she would not see 10 again, which usually means like that's an age thing. mm -hmm. So do they have like a child servant? That's the impression I got from earlier when I introduced her way back. I don't know. Ooh. She's, she's their servant, but it sounded to me like she was a child, young, but I, I could be in, misinterpreting that. I'm honestly not sure. Yeah. I, I think I overlooked that line because I might've gotten confused. So I don't remember. Well, and I could be misreading that bit too, but either way, she's the, the only servant, but they call her the servants. Did you notice that they were like, they had gotten in the habit of calling her the servants, but they only can afford one. <laughs> I know. I think it's so funny. The fact that they're so concerned about like their image that they like just make random claims. Mm-hmm. They're like the servants will start to talk <laughs> like the one that we have over there. Yeah. She'll start to talk. <laughs> Lisa, uh, Liza comes in with Nana and is like super pissed because apparently she's trying to make like Christmas cookies or something. Christmas pudding. Right. And it mentions snow on the ground, so I guess this is technically a Christmas story, although I did not notice that in my first read-through of it. Yeah, I didn't really realize that either, to be honest. Because they, like, don't make much of a deal about it, so far at least. Nope. Nope. Uh, But yeah, she's basically, like... I I feel like I've done this. No, I have done this. Like, when I had a dog, my dog used to bark if uh, she thought there was people at the door. So I would, like, hold her and like open the door for her and be like there's no one here yeah you know so i I think we've all done this with our dogs oh yeah so So. uh then she's like if you bark again like i'm gonna tell uh mr darling to get rid of you or something Mm -hmm. and then nana ends up breaking free of her chain and ran to the neighbors to go get the parents which already top tier i don't i know nana's not getting paid but she should be she really should be she's like super dog breaking the chain to go Mm -hmm. like get help for her children yep and then all the kids are and then we flash back to the kids and all the kids are like excited to be leaving but wendy's starting to have like some doubts because apparently wendy's the only logical one uh and then we get you know flying practice yeah then they get flying practice and they're gone seconds before the parents could even walk in yeah then we are on to chapter four this is where it's revealed that they flew for like days days yes Uh, days and nights yeah days and nights as we mentioned they'd start to like fall asleep and like they were trying to get food and like peter apparently has been like alive for thousands of years and still hasn't figured out how to feed himself yeah yeah, then, he just pulls the food out of bird beaks. Yep. And... Which, like, is usually worms. Like, they're saying, like, it's bread and cheese. <laughs> no, I've never seen a bird have bread or cheese. <laughs> and then he just, he leaves them sometimes for yeah. apparently hours on end. And they just keep flying. And they're like, should we go back? And like, well, we can't find our way back. And we don't know how to stop. So we just got to keep going and hope he comes back. Like, have you ever been on a road trip with a friend that's, like, doing the directions and then they fall asleep? And you're like, where do we go? You're like, <laughs> smack them a little bit. You're like, hey, where are we going? And then they're like, oh, just keep go st- going straight until I tell you not to. And then you like, they fall asleep again. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then when he comes back, sometimes he doesn't remember mm-hmm. who they are. And Wendy has to remind him. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that's all about. I don't know either. Like, that was really weird. All I yeah. can think is like, I don't know. Think it's... of Dory, you know, in yeah. Finding Nemo, <laughs> the short-term memory loss. But I don't know. Like he's either just so self self-absorbed mm-hmm. that he just, you know, he goes off and gets all involved in doing something, and then just completely forgets what he was doing. But mm-hmm. he he does come back, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And then the sun points out Neverland by using a bunch of like arrows. Which I can I didn't know if this was like comical arrows or like this is like rays of light. I don't know. 
I'm oh. picturing like these neon signs, these neon arrows, you know, like Vegas or something pointing. I me know. too, me too, because I thought that would be the funniest way. <laughs> so it does turn out to be the same Neverland that they all had in their dreams, which terrifies me. Mm-hmm. And then they like go on to say that Neverland gets really scary at nighttime, and there's like all these like monsters that are coming out. Yes, which felt very fey to me. Yeah, like I feel like that's something that I mean I've only read a couple of like I I mostly read like fey retellings more so than mm-hmm. I've read like original fey fairy tales, but like that seems to be something that's very prevalent in all the retellings that I've yes. read. I definitely lean into that in mind too. I'm so excited to read yours. <laughs> I was like, I need to read, start Peter Pan a little bit and then I can like read yours and then compare while I'm going through it. But and I'm know, like, mm, I'm probably going to start it this weekend. And you know what, what's cool too is it's like, well, cool, scary mm-hmm. is as they're approaching, it's like they can feel like this ominous presence resisting them. And sometimes mm-hmm. Peter has to like punch through it with his fists and he says, they don't want us to land. And yeah. I don't think, from my previous reading, I don't think it ever really explains who they are or yeah. why they don't want them to land. So it's all very strange and mysterious. This is, like, apt for, like, a gothic, yes. scary retelling. Yes. There, there are some definite, yeah. I've got notes. You know what? At this point, like... Add it to the list of yeah, like go for things it. that oh, I want to write. Oh, I would so read that. Ugh. Like a really like gothic atmosphere. Yes. Retelling of it. I love that. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I like <laughs> too many ideas, right? Know, that's the worst too part too. Not enough time. Not enough time. If I could clone myself, I would be a happy woman. Yes. Like, if I could, what is that? Like, in, um, all I can think about is Sky High, that girl that's a cheerleader, but she's the whole cheer squad. Oh, if really? If I could do I that, that. Have you never seen it? I don't think so. It yeah. came out in, like, 2006. That sounds amazing, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's, like, it's pretty good. But, like, the whole story is, like, you're either a superhero or you're a sky sidekick. You know what's weird is I have... Like the lost kids in mine have powers. They all have powers. Mm-hmm. And I have one girl. Well, there's they're twins, but they can clone themselves. Oh. So that's a really weird coincidence that you mentioned that. That just would be such a great superpower in my mind. Like, I think it's underrated. Yes. Because then it's you, but you can do like all the things mm-hmm. that you want. It's amazing. I would have, my house would be so clean all the time. Right. I would never you worry about pull down like five jobs, you know, yeah. and make tons of money. And then part of some of you could go on vacation. Mm-hmm. Like it'd be great. Ugh. The dream truly. <laughs> this podcast would become a lot easier to edit. Oh yes. Peter then asked if they would rather kill a pirate first or have tea. What? what? <laughs> And then they say, do you kill many? And he's like, tons. He kills tons. Of, he kills all the time. Yeah. He's like this murderous little. No wonder he... Neverland doesn't want him to land. You know, that's a good point. <laughs> he's like killing half their population. It's like, here comes the little psychopathic murderer again. Yeah. Also, how does a 10 year old best you? I don't know. And he says he doesn't sneak up on them on them and kill them. Like, mm-hmm. he seems to take offense at that idea that he would sneak up and do mm-hmm. it while the guy's asleep, you know. So he has, like, a tiny little code of honor. Mm-hmm. But not much of one. Yeah. Not much of a moral code. And then he's like, yeah, I have a rule with the Lost Boys. You have to follow this rule. That if we ever meet Hook in battle, I have to be the one to kill him. And then, like, Michael's like, sure, dude. Like, I'm not going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> what? And then they also say that Hook was Blackbeard's bosun, and he's apparently terrifying. Which, again, my only experience with Peter Pan is the Disney movie, which, in like, Hook was basically just kind of like this bumbling fool. Kind of, yeah. 
So yeah, like they the, didn't ready for the gothic retelling because if he's actually terrifying, this is gonna be a lot more interesting. Yep. Yeah, he's apparently very intelligent and like well spoken. It, it says that later, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where exactly. Is a crocodile a part of this? I don't know. We'll find out. It comes in later. I oh, it think. does. Okay. I don't. I read a little further ahead, so I won't say anymore because I don't want to like. I don't know where certain things come in. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, so then Peter does reveal that he's the one that cut off Hook's hand. And that, uh, you know, he's probably aiming a gun at them right now. And Wendy's like, Tinkerbell is literally a target for us. She is lighting us all up. And so they decide to put Tinkerbell into a hat so that she isn't lighting everything up and like basically showing them where to shoot. Yeah. Um and then Tink's like, hey, Wendy, come with me. And that's where it leaves us. But then like yep. they also leave us with the ominous note that like he she is literally being led to her doom right now. Mm-hmm. And that's where we get left off. Solid cliffhanger. cliffhanger. Yes. I will say, I couldn't imagine if you're reading this to your kid, though, because then, like, your kids could be like, um, read more, please. Yes. And you're gonna be like, no, child. There you go. So that, that cliffhanger is skillfully done, for yeah. sure. I am really excited to read the rest. I don't know. Like, I feel like there's a lot of parts where the Disney one seems to come over, but, like, this is so much darker. It really is. I'm so excited. <laughs> so that's all we have for today. Do you have anything else you want to add? I don't think so. Not. I can't think of anything else. I had a few notes, but they're for the next chapters. So. Okay. So we will be resuming the next chapter next week. But before then, where can all the people on the internet find you and your books? So um, I hang out on Twitter a lot. And I'm there at... Rebecca F. Kenny one. Um, and I'm also on TikTok, and I think I'm just Rebecca F. Kenny over there. I think that's my handle. Um, so yeah, those are probably the two main places. And in both of those, I have my link tree in my bio. So that's where you can jump in and check out all the books. And I will link those in the description so you all can read them and enjoy them and he read it before we talk about Peter Pan. So make sure to read Wendy Darling, like starting now, probably. I don't know how long it'll take you all to read. Uh, then you can listen to us talk about it over on Patreon. But we will catch you all in the next episode where we find out, does uh, Peter Pan win? I don't know. We'll see. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Barely Bookish Podcast. This coming week, uh, the first Friday of the month, we will be having the Kindred Graphic Novel with Candace over on Patreon. So if you want to join the Patreon, you can join for as low as $1 a month and get some exclusive access to some lovely extra content and also help support the show. Uh, we will also be doing, um, the month after, Rebecca F. Kenny's uh, Wendy Darling and also Captain Pan so if you want to check those out uh, please join and then you get a lot of cool content plus like almost a year's worth of bonus content which is pretty cool but thank you all so much for listening if you want to find me I'm at Barely Bookish on literally everything I have all the platforms uh, I'm also playing a lot of Elden Ring on Twitch and also streaming a lot of writing sprints so yeah, you can find me over at twitch.tv slash bookish if you want to see my face instead of just hear my voice. But I will catch you all right here next week with even more Peter Pan. Thank you all so much for listening. Our logo was designed by my little sibling, Sarah. Our theme song was by Raphael Crux on freepd.com. I'll catch you all later. Bye.